Hi guys, you're Dean here. So, um, I had some minor difficulties, I guess, with my computer again. Um, so I went back to Windows to try and fix the the video problems with the my hair is stuck in under my headphones. And I can't hear. Well, I guess I can hear myself anyway, but there. That's better. It doesn't feel like it's coming off now. Um, so, um, sorry about starting late. I, um, when I went back to Windows, I forgot to move over the scenes for the, for the stream, and, and, uh, I ended up, uh, just trying to get back in, couldn't get back in just before the stream. It's like, ah. So I had to rebuild it before I could start up. But it didn't take too long, I guess. Uh, you know, 35, 40 minutes or so. But anyway, that's okay. Uh, stuff that happens. Um, yeah. So um, either way, we're we're kind of we're kind of good. We're kind of good. Hi, Brian. How are you doing, honey? I'm just trying to get things uh, sent out here. Uh, it would help if my brain didn't just kind of lock up on me. Twitter. I'm back on. Um, I'm back on Windows now, so that's good. Yay! Can you hear me all right? I kind of did a quick, really, really quick setup on on uh, getting this started up, so. I don't know if you guys could hear me or not. It was streaming okay. What's going on? All that fun stuff. There. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Usually you don't catch me live. So that's awesome. I'm glad to see you here for sure. I, um, I managed to. Oh, there we go. Why is it? Mm, I press close, not open. Um, I managed to get this kind of all set up, so yay. Let's see. Oops. Um, so, it's not. Sh why isn't it showing up that I've. It's been retweeted. Tweets and replies. There we go. Uh, huh. I'm trying to be, um, it was over in, um, Diana. Is she streaming? Oh, good. Um, yeah, I, I usually am almost done by now, but because of the darn, um, darn thing, I, uh, uh we'll just do it like this. Hands, um, oops, cancel. There we go. Aha. And hands and uh, who else do I usually send it to? I don't know. I'm I'm just I usually send it to you. <laughs> um and um and Josiah or uh, Reese uh, and um uh, who else uh, Le oh, they are always an entertaining group i I love being there i'm I've been feeling too horrible to join streams lately, and uh I'm trying to do this today, and we'll see how far it goes i'm supposed to I'm scheduled to do up books. There are chapters six to three in this book that I'm working on, and uh, we'll see. Who knows? It could end up 
uh, Brookie. Rook. There, that'll do for now. Um, so, yeah, um, I am. Um, well, I'm on Windows now, so that's good. Oh, look at that, that worked. Look, your name's coming up. I don't think it, I don't know if it's clear or not, but hey, well, whatever. Whatever. It looks like I'm coming through all nice and streamy like. Yay, okay. Okay, it looks half decent, so. But, um, I haven't got the stupid camera to not be all blurry. Annoying. Annoying as heck. And, um, so I'm doing the, um, I've been trying, working on, um, trying to figure out how to fix that. And it's, um, I guess we'll see if we can figure it out. And look at that! It's all set up. It's all set up pretty good. Okay, it's it's working good. I'm I'm pretty impressed with myself. Uh, so uh, excuse me. There. Yeah, the the camera the camera stuff is is usually is um. I've been trying to figure out if, because uh, everything I've read about the camera issues that I'm having is that there's too much camera information trying to go through the CPU at one time. And it's basically bottlenecking. So the one camera will go through fine, but the other one's kind of got like... Ugh. Now, it could be the camera too, who knows. Either way, it's blurry. And um, so moving my hands causes uh, um, trails. So it's no good for doing even recording at this point. So it's, it's a pain in the a pain in the butt. So I'm trying to figure out if adding on a new USB hub would help because I can put the USB hub on the PCI slot and the PCI slot should be okay for jamming that through, um, in theory. But I have to ca talk to a couple of people first and see. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of what's going on. Um, it's chilly here today. I'm just about froze. But hey, what do you do? Um. Yeah, but it's it's as high as it'll go. There's no lower frame rate, and um, like it's a frame rate of thirty. But because the two the two cameras are going in on the same bus, that um, they are um, they're just kind of jamming in together. But I did change the frame rate on this camera to like fifteen because it's not like my head's moving much. And um this still is not helping, so I don't know if it's the camera or if it's the if it's the what. Um I've tried running the one camera by itself and it still seems to do it, so I don't know, it could be the camera too. Either way, the cheaper thing for me to do is to do the USB bus and maybe put this camera on the bus and, and have the other one on the other one. I'll have to see because it could be the camera. Like, oh, we suck. Cause I can't afford another webcam, like a decent webcam. But you know, such is life. My cam, my computer's right there. <laughs> um. Anyway, I'll play the books. Uh, it's east of the sun and west of the moon. I'll be working on on the blender. Um. I learned how to do this thingy me bobby here. Manually size the resources to use the different values on low. Um, yes, I have. Um, I'll check the resources sharing conflict, but I've got them on separate buses right now. 
and um, it's still the one camera's kind of like it's blurry with my hands but it's okay with my face because my face isn't moving much so I don't know um, is it lagging? It shouldn't be lagging. Oh, we know where's the wrong window. Yeah. My stream health looks to be okay. Huh? Is it is is it my stream that's lagging for you, or am I mis misunderstanding what you're saying? It shouldn't be lagging at all. Like my my uploads like five hundred megabits. My downloads like five hundred. My well, my uploads are anywhere between three hundred to five hundred. Uh, okay. Maybe okay. <laughs> I'm like oh no, it doesn't look like it's lagging. <laughs> I've been I've been bagging my head against this for too long, honey. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, well, that'll do it. <laughs> you know, you could put the quality down. <laughs> if you put the video quality down a bit, it'll, um, it'll help. Yep. It'll help. But, uh, I, I appreciate you coming by and saying hi. That's always fun. I'm, I always love seeing you. And I'm sorry I haven't been around much. Just, just pain is pain and you know how that is it's uh it just gets you sometimes hopefully my doctor's appointment soon I really hope so <sighs> I'm already tired I'm gonna start the stream cause it'll by the time the, the, this four books will finish it'll end up being supper time so um enjoy and you know you can watch me screw around. I want to test. Um, what I'm doing is um, I learned how to do the little squarey boxy thing. Um, I know you can't see my mouse moving right now. Can you um, can you see my mouse moving on the screen for the blender? I I don't know if I set that up right. Like do you see my mouse moving around? Do do do. Do 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 flashes. Okay, it just means I'm moving it too fast. <laughs> okay, so the thingy here on the side, that little squarey picture thing, is um a color what's called a color map. I didn't a lot of people do it like really nice. I just kinda did it back and forth so I can see the difference. Um so I can see the difference in the colors and um from what it looks like is doing it this way and assigning the colors into the little well it's it's sort of a color chooser sort of um instead of having each little orb like I'm just doing up a materials kind of file but it was running really slow, so I moved this over here to test it. And um, what it is, is I'm comparing whether um, whether using this method will help um, render the file faster than doing the old other method which is choosing your color instead of choosing like um a choose having a color for each of the excuse me having a separate color of its own whereas this one here um uh, I'll move to the other scene let's see there we go this one here and all of these on this screen are using this and if you look at this, you see the, um, oops, I don't know if you can see that one. There we go. We'll move over here. There we go. 
Um, you see this one in here? Um, what it does is it ends up coming up really big and you shrink it down and you cover it over the color you want it to be. So if you can see that, and it will just um, oh grab. There we go. So you can see it's turning purple and blue and red and green and blah, 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 blah. And so this is whatever color. So if I if I say where to put it over a bunch of colors, it would be a bunch of colors. Or if I could go, if I sized it and made it bigger. Oops, I made it upside down. And um, made it bigger. It would, um, but yeah, it's supposed to help the render speed. So I made this a file. So this is what some people re recommend when doing low poly stuff. Um, oops, grab. Uh, there. Got to make sure it's inside the square. Um, well, not not really. It's sort of. It depends on many, many factors. <laughs> a lower resolution will render faster, but more items in a thing, more um, color effects, more, um, like, say, my background here. My original background was a good resolution at two, like this stone is an actual picture of a stone by where I live, uh, where I grew up at. And it is, uh, the original picture was t uh, 2K, or 2, two megs, uh, 200 and, uh, two, 2000, or no, it was 5 megs. It was 2048 by 248. And um, the rendering took forever. Oh yeah, you know, you know, you got the basics, and that's what I've got too. Um, I'm just learning a lot more about it, and I realized that the, um, yeah, texture rendering can slow it down too. I've edited how I've textured this, um, because it's not actually textured, and the more polygons it has can be can cause a problem too that is why all my orbs aren't orbs anymore <laughs> they are uh, basically I've um, this one here has uh, 32 vertices 56 edges 26 faces and whatever the trace is but if you go in in the whole oops a tab oops where, Tab. There we go. Aha! This whole scene has um, 2,500 vertices, 2,000 faces, uh, 4,500 trees, whatever, and 72 objects, and some light, whatever. Anyway, when I had the whole spheres as a full sphere, it was uh, the vertices got up into the 280,000 range. <laughs> it took forever. It took like five minutes to do this. It drove me nuts. But like here, if I press F12 here, which is what I'll start to render. I don't I don't know if this will affect the stream either. Either way, we'll find out because uh, the stream's running on... Um, the stream's running on the uh, uh, GPU too. Yeah, and it, and what? Um, but what I've got with the picture is I'm using a normal map and a bump map and a specular map to 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 give it a pretend depth. And uh, it's at ninety eight percent now. So let's uh, let's go have a look. Um, um, render results and uh, let's see so it's remaining 47 48 seconds so this one right now is taking a minute and some 
well, it was taking over five minutes, and the, and the one I tried to do was 20-odd minutes, and I'm like, ah, but it had a lot of um, the stone texture, and it took forever, and I couldn't figure out what it was, and I realized it's probably because those pictures are five megs, and then there's this specular map, and that's five, eight megs, and the normal map, and the blah, 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 and they, all these, these, there's five pictures hooked to these, and it was taking, like, a huge amount of space. So, one and a half minutes. I, I ended up changing the, all the way up to the top, uh, I ended up changing the, um, display, oops, wrong one, there we go, there. The display, I changed the wood and the um, the wood material and the to be 512 and the stone material to be 512 and I've changed it so that it's um, not uh, so that it's not five different images but just one and it's split up to give that effect. So. Yay. Yeah, CAD's fun too. I haven't I haven't played with CAD much. It's been Um, no, the screen la layers are only each layer is only rendered at at as it is when you do it the way I just did. <laughs> um, so it's only rendering the active layer. Uh, the rest doesn't matter. Um now if I were to say go and render the whole screen with all the layers in there like to to say do an animation it would like you can see the settings over here if I were to actually instead of hitting the render button which renders your active screen which is this one and hit the animation it would do everything and um like there's a snowfall scene that I did up, um, but yeah, I just I I want to test to see if this other thing helps because I figured out how to make it so that the resolutions are adjustable, and I found that um, this resolution being 720p um, works because you can uh, downsize it and upsize it pretty easy. So if I wanted a nice picture, it would work good. Open a new tab. <sighs> oh yeah, no, I've done the light bouncy thing and I've clamped the values and I've... I haven't baked anything yet. I try to avoid baking because a lot of my stuff is more like if it's just a picture it takes as long to bake it as it does to render it so it that doesn't save any time um oh open up open up oh oh that's because i had to click there okay um where is it there it is um But yeah, this this is this is actually what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm using like um, I've done. I'll have to look. Um, I've done that. I've got that model optimization. Um, Relies heavily on, and if you have a low amount of memory, it can take a very long time. But the truth is, you have to have at least 40 gigs of memory in your PC. You should be able to blah 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 blah. Um, using material hacks, I'll have to look, uh, because most of it is stuff that I'm already doing. Baked lighting.
Okay, now I'm going to stop. I, I'm going <laughs> to... <laughs> well, if you need it... Oh, hurry back. Okay, I'm gonna start the book. Quit, quit chatting, Nadine, because by the time this is done, I'm, uh, you know, the supper's gotta be ready. Okay. Okay, let's see. There we go. Whoop me. Section three of East of the Sun and West of the Moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shushan. East of the Sun and West of the Moon by Peter Christen Esbjörnsen and Jern Ingebrigtsen Moe. Translated by George Webb Descent. Section 3. Prince Lindworm. Once upon a time there was a fine young king who was married to the loveliest of queens. They were exceedingly happy, all but for one thing. They had no children, and this often made them both sad because the queen wanted a dear little child to play with, and the king wanted an heir to the kingdom. One day the queen went out for a walk by herself, and she met an ugly old woman. The old woman was just like a witch, but she was a nice kind of witch, not the cantankerous sort. She said, "'Why do you look so doleful, pretty lady?' "'It's no use my telling you,' answered the queen." "'Nobody in the world can help me.' "'Oh, you never know,' said the old woman. "'Just you let me hear what your trouble is, "'and maybe I can put things right.' "'My dear woman, how can you?' said the queen, and she told her. "'The king and I have no children. "'That's why I am so distressed.' "'Well, you needn't be,' said the old witch. I can set that right in a twinkling, if only you will do exactly as I tell you. Listen. Tonight, at sunset, take a little drinking cup with two ears, that is, handles, and put it bottom upwards on the ground in the northwest corner of your garden. Then go and lift it up tomorrow morning at sunrise, and you will find two roses underneath it, one red and one white. If you eat the red rose, a little boy will be born to you. If you eat the white rose, a little girl will be sent. But whatever you do, you mustn't eat both the roses, or you'll be sorry. That I warn you. Only one, remember that. Thank you a thousand times, said the queen. This is good news indeed. And she wanted to give the old woman her gold ring, but the old woman wouldn't take it. So the queen went home and did as she had been told, and next morning at sunrise she stole out into the garden and lifted up the little drinking cup. She was surprised, for indeed she had hardly expected to see anything. But there were the two roses underneath it, one red and one white, and now she was dreadfully puzzled, for she did not know which to choose. If I choose the red one, she thought, and I have a little boy, he may grow up and go to the wars and get killed. But if I choose the white one and have a little girl, she will stay at home a while with us, but later on she will get married and go away and leave us. So whichever it is, we may be left with no child after all. However, at last she decided on the white rose, and she ate it, and it tasted so sweet that she took and ate the red one too, without ever remembering the old woman's solemn warning. Some time after this the king went away to the wars, and while he was still away the queen became the mother of twins. 
One was a lovely baby boy, and the other was a lindworm, or serpent. She was terribly frightened when she saw the lindworm, but he wriggled away out of the room, and nobody seemed to have seen him but herself, so that she thought it must have been a dream. The baby prince was so beautiful and so healthy, the queen was full of joy, and likewise, as you may suppose, was the king, when he came home and found his son and heir. Not a word was said by anyone about the lindworm, only the queen thought about it now and then. Well, no use, for at the first crossways there lay the lindworm again, crying out, A bride for me before a bride for you. So the prince had to turn back home again to the castle, and give up his visits to the foreign kingdoms, and his mother, the queen, had to confess that what the lindworm said was true, for he was really the eldest of her twins, and so he ought to have a wedding first. There seemed nothing for it but to find a bride for the lindworm, if his younger brother the prince were to be married at all. So the king wrote to a distant country, and asked for a princess to marry his son, but of course he didn't say which son, and presently a princess arrived. But she wasn't allowed to see her bridegroom until he stood by her side in the great hall and was married to her. And then, of course, it was too late for her to say she wouldn't have him. But next morning the princess had disappeared. The lindworm lay sleeping all alone, and it was quite plain that he had eaten her. A little while after the prince decided that he might now go journeying again in search of a princess, and off he drove in the royal chariot with the six white horses. But at the first crossways there lay the lindworm crying with his great wide open mouth, A bride for me before a bride for you. So the carriage tried another road, and the same thing happened, and they had to turn back again this time just as formerly. And the king wrote to several foreign countries to know if any one would marry his son. At last another princess arrived, this time from a very far distant land. And, of course, she was not allowed to see her future husband before the wedding took place. And then, lo and behold, it was the lindworm who stood at her side. And next morning the princess had disappeared, and the lindworm lay sleeping all alone, and it was quite clear that he had eaten her. By and by the prince started on his quest for the third time, and at the first crossroads there lay the lindworm with his great wide open mouth demanding a bride as before. And the prince went straight back to the castle and told the king, "'You must find another bride for my elder brother.' "'I don't know where I am to find her,' said the king. "'I have already made enemies of two great kings who sent their daughters here as brides, and I have no notion how I can obtain a third lady. People are beginning to say strange things, and I am sure no princess will dare to come.' Now, down in a little cottage near a wood, there lived the king's shepherd, an old man with his only daughter. And the king came one day and said to him, "'Will you give me your daughter to marry my son, the lindworm? And I will make you rich for the rest of your life.' "'No, sir,' said the shepherd. "'That I cannot do. She is my only child, and I want her to take care of me when I am old.' "'Besides, if the lindworm would not spare two beautiful princesses, he won't spare her either. "'He will just gobble her up, and she is much too good for such a fate.' "'But the king wouldn't take no for an answer, and at last the old man had to give in. "'Well, when the old shepherd told his daughter that she was to be Prince Lindworm's bride, "'she was utterly in despair.' She went out into the woods crying and wringing her hands and bewailing her hard fate, and while she wandered to and fro, an old witch-woman suddenly appeared out of a big hollow oak tree and asked her, "'Why do you look so doleful, pretty lass?' the shepherd girl said. "'It's no use my telling you, for nobody in the world can help me.' "'Oh, you never know,' said the old woman." "'Just you let me hear what your trouble is, and maybe I can put things right.' Oh, "'How can you?' said the girl. "'For I am to be married to the king's eldest son, who is a lindworm. "'He has already married two beautiful princesses, and devoured them, "'and he will eat me too. No wonder I am distressed.' 
"'Well, you needn't be,' said the witch-woman. "'All that can be set right in a twinkling, "'if only you will do exactly as I tell you.' "'So the girl said she would. "'Listen, then,' said the old woman. "'After the marriage ceremony is over, "'and when it is time for you to retire to rest, "'you must ask to be dressed in ten snow-white shifts, "'and you must then ask for a tub full of lye, "'that is, washing-water prepared with wood-ashes, "'and a tub full of fresh milk "'and as many whips as a boy can carry in his arms, "'and have all these brought into your bedchamber. "'Then, when the lindworm tells you to shed a shift, "'do you bid him slough a skin, "'and when all his skins are off "'you must dip the whips in the lye and whip him. "'Next you must wash him in the fresh milk, "'and lastly you must take him and hold him in your arms, "'if it's only for one moment.' "'The last is the worst notion. Ugh!' said the shepherd's daughter, and she shuddered at the thought of holding the cold, slimy, scaly lindworm. "'Do just as I have said, and all will go well,' said the old woman. Then she disappeared again in the oak tree. When the wedding day arrived, the girl was fetched in the royal chariot with the six white horses, and taken to the castle to be decked as a bride, and she asked for ten snow-white shifts to be brought her, and the tub of lye, and the tub of milk, and as many whips as a boy could carry in his arms. The ladies and courtiers in the castle thought, of course, that this was some bit of peasant superstition, all rubbish and nonsense. But the king said, "'Let her have whatever she asks for.' She was then arrayed in the most wonderful robes, and looked the loveliest of brides. She was led to the hall where the wedding ceremony was to take place." and she saw the lindworm for the first time as he came in and stood by her side. So they were married, and a great wedding feast was held, a banquet fit for the son of a king. Illustration. She saw the lindworm for the first time as he came in and stood by her side. When the feast was over, the bridegroom and bride were conducted to their apartment with music and torches and a great procession. As soon as the door was shut, the lindworm turned to her and said, "'Fair maiden, shed a shift.' The shepherd's daughter answered him, "'Prince Lindworm, schlaf a skin.' "'No one has ever dared tell me to do that before,' said he. "'But I command you to do it now,' said she. Then he began to moan and wriggle, and in a few minutes a long snake-skin lay upon the floor beside him. The girl drew off her first shift and spread it on top of the skin. The Lindworm said again to her, "'Fair maiden, shed a shift.' The shepherd's daughter answered him, "'Prince Lindworm, slough a skin.' "'No one has ever dared tell me to do that before,' said he. "'But I command you to do it now,' said she. Then with groans and moans he cast off the second skin, and she covered it with her second shift. The Lindworm said for the third time, "'Fair maiden, shed a shift.' The shepherd's daughter answered him again, "'Prince Lindworm, slough a skin.' "'No one has ever dared tell me to do that before,' said he, and his little eyes rolled furiously. But the girl was not afraid, and once more she commanded him to do as she bade. And so this went on until nine Lindworm skins were lying on the floor, each of them covered with a snow-white shift, and there was nothing left of the Lindworm but a huge thick mass, most horrible to see." Then the girl seized the whips, dipped them in the lye, and whipped him as hard as ever she could. Next she bathed him all over in the fresh milk. Lastly she dragged him on to the bed and put her arms round him, and she fell fast asleep that very moment. Next morning, very early, the king and the courtiers came and peeped in through the keyhole. They wanted to know what had become of the girl, but none of them dared enter the room. However, in the end, growing bolder, they opened the door a tiny bit, and there they saw the girl, all fresh and rosy, and beside her lay no lindworm, but the handsomest prince that any one could wish to see. The king ran out and fetched the queen, and after that there were such rejoicings in the castle as never were known before or since. 
the wedding took place all over again much finer than the first with festivals and banquets and merry-makings for days and weeks no bride was ever so beloved by a king and queen as this peasant maid from the shepherd's cottage there was no end to their love and their kindness towards her because by her sense and her calmness and her courage she had saved their son prince lindworm end of section 3 recording by shushan Section 4 of East of the Sun and West of the Moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. East of the Sun and West of the Moon by Peta Christian Espionsen and Jan Engebretsen Mo. Translated by George Webb Descent. Section 4 The Lassie and Her Godmother. Once on a time a poor couple lived far, far away in a great wood. The wife was brought to bed, and had a pretty girl, but they were so poor that they did not know how to get the babe christened, for they had no money to pay the parson's fees. So one day the father went out to see if he could find any one who was willing to stand for the child and pay the fees. But though he walked about the whole day from one house to another, and though all said they were willing enough to stand— no one thought himself bound to pay the fees. Now, when he was going home again, a lovely lady met him, dressed so fine, and she looked so thoroughly good and kind. She offered to get the babe christened, but after that, she said, she must keep it for her own. The husband answered, he must first ask his wife what she wished to do, but when he got home and told his story, the wife said right out, No! Next day the man went out again, but no one would stand if they had to pay the fees, and though he begged and prayed, he could get no help. And again, as he went home, towards evening the same lovely lady met him, who looked so sweet and good, and she made him the same offer. So he told his wife again how he had fared, and this time she said, if he couldn't get any one to stand for his babe next day, they must just let the lady have her way, since she seems so kind and good. The third day the man went about, but he couldn't get any one to stand, and so when towards evening he met the kind lady again, he gave his word she should have the babe if she would only get it christened at the font. So next morning she came to the place where the man lived, followed by two men to stand godfathers, took the babe and carried it to the church, and there it was christened. After that she took it to her own house, and there the little girl lived with her several years, and her foster-mother was always kind and friendly to her. Now when the lassie had grown to be big enough to know right and wrong, her foster-mother got ready to go on a journey. "'You have my leave,' she said, "'to go all over the house, except those rooms which I shew you.' And when she had said that, away she went. But the lassie could not forbear just to open one of the doors a little bit when, pop, out flew a star. When her foster-mother came back she was very vexed to find that the star had flown out, and she got very angry with her foster-daughter, and threatened to send her away. But the child cried and begged so hard that she got leave to stay. Now, after a while, the foster-mother had to go on another journey, and before she went she forbade the lassie to go into those two rooms into which she had never been. She promised to beware, but when she was left alone, she began to think and to wonder what there could be in the second room, and at last she could not help setting the door a little ajar, just to peep in, when, pop, out flew the moon. When her foster-mother came home and found the moon let out, she was very downcast, and said to the lassie she must go away. She could not stay with her any longer. But the lassie wept so bitterly and prayed so heartily for forgiveness, that this time, too, she got leave to stay. Some time after, the foster-mother had to go away again, and she charged the lassie, who by this time was half grown up, 
most earnestly that she mustn't try to go into or to peep into the third room but when her foster-mother had been gone some time and the lassie was weary of walking about alone all at once she thought dear me what fun it would be just to peep a little into that third room then she thought she mustn't do it for her foster-mother's sake but when the bad thought came the second time she could hold out no longer come what might she must and would look into the room so she just opened the door a tiny bit when pop out flew the sun but when her foster-mother came back and saw that the sun had flown away she was cut to the heart and said now there was no help for it the lassie must and should go away she couldn't hear of her staying any longer now the lassie cried her eyes out and begged and prayed so prettily but it was all no good nay but i must punish you said her foster-mother but you may have your choice either to be the loveliest woman in the world and not be able to speak or to keep your speech and to be the ugliest of all women but away from me you must go and the lassie said i would sooner be lovely so she became all at once wondrous fair but from that day forth she was dumb so when she went away from her foster-mother she walked and wandered through a great great wood but the farther she went the farther off the end seemed to be so when the evening came on she climbed up into a tall tree which grew over a spring and there she made herself up to sleep that night close by lay a castle and from that castle came early every morning a maid to draw water to make the prince's tea from the spring over which the lassie was sitting so the maid looked down into the spring saw the lovely face in the water and thought it was her own then she flung away the pitcher and ran home and when she got there she tossed up her head and said if i am so pretty i'm far too good to go and fetch water so another maid had to go for the water but the same thing happened to her she went back and said she was far too pretty and too good to fetch water from the spring for the prince then the prince went himself for he had a mind to see what all this could mean so when he reached the spring he too saw the image in the water but he looked up at once and became aware of the lovely lassie who sat there up in the tree then he coaxed her down and took her home and at last made up his mind to have her for his queen because she was so lovely but his mother who was still alive was against it she can't speak she said and maybe she's a wicked witch but the prince could not be content till he got her so after they had lived together a while the lassie was to have a child and when the child came to be born the prince set a strong watch about her but at the birth one and all fell into a deep sleep and her foster-mother came cut the babe on its little finger and smeared the queen's mouth with the blood and said now you shall be as grieved as i was when you let out the star and with these words she carried off the babe but when those who were on the watch woke they thought the queen had eaten her own child and the old queen was all for burning her alive but the prince was so fond of her that at last he begged her off but he had hard work to set her free so the next time the young queen was to have a child twice as strong a watch was set as the first time but the same thing happened over again only this time her foster-mother said now you shall be as grieved as i was when you let the moon out and the queen begged and prayed and wept for when her foster-mother was there she could speak but it was all no good and now the old queen said she must be burnt but the prince found means to beg her off but when the third child was to be born a watch was set three times as strong as the first but just the same thing happened her foster-mother came while the watch slept took the babe and cut its little finger and smeared the queen's mouth with the blood telling her now she should be as grieved as she was when the lassie let out the sun and now the prince could not save her any longer she must and should be burnt 
but just as they were leading her to the stake all at once they saw her foster-mother who came with all three children two she led by the hand and the third she had on her arm and so she went up to the young queen and said here are your children now you shall have them again i am the virgin mary and so grieved as you have been so grieved was i when you let out the sun and moon and star now you have been punished for what you did and henceforth you shall have your speech how glad the queen and prince now were all may easily think but no one can tell after that they were always happy and from that day even the prince's mother was very fond of the young queen end of section four recording by rhonda fetterman Section 5 of East of the Sun and West of the Moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anna. East of the Sun and West of the Moon by Peter Christen Isbjansen and Young Ingebretsen Moe. Translated by George Webb Dunsant. Section 5. The Husband Who Was to Mind the House Once on a time there was a man, so surly and cross, he never thought his wife he did everything right in the house. So, one evening, in haymaking time, he came home, scolding and swearing, and showing his teeth and making a dust. Dear love, don't be so angry, there's a good man, said his goody. Tomorrow let's change our work i'll go out with the mowers and mow and you shall mind the house at home yes the husband thought that would do very well he was quite willing he said so early next morning his goody took a scythe over her neck and went out into the hayfield with the mowers and began to mow but the man was to mind the house and do the work at home first of all he wanted to turn the butter but when he had churned it a while he got thirsty and went out to the cellar to tap a barrel of ale so just when he had knocked in the burn he was putting the tap into the cask he heard overhead the pig came into the kitchen then off he ran up the cellar steps with the tap in his hand as fast as he could to look after the pig lest he should upset the churn but when he got up and saw the pig had already knocked the churn over and stood there routing and grunting amongst the cream which was running all over the floor he got so wild with rage that he quite forgot the ale barrel and ran at the pig as hard as he could he caught it too just as it ran out of doors and gave it such a kick that piggy lay for dead on the spot then all at once he remembered he had the tap in his hand but when he got down to the cellar every drop of ale had run out of the cask then he went into the dairy and found enough cream left to fill the churn again and so he began to churn for butter they must have at dinner when he had churned a bit he remembered that their milking cow was still shut up in the byre and hadn't had a bit to eat or a drop to drink all the morning though the sun was high then all at once he thought it was too far to take her down to the meadow so he had just get her up on the house top for the house you must know was thatched with sods and a fine crop of grass was growing there now the house lay close up against the steep down and he thought if he laid a plank across to the thatch at the back he'd easily get the cow up but still he couldn't leave the churn for there was his little babe crawling about on the floor and if i leave it he thought the child is safe to upset it so he took the churn on his back and went out with it but then he thought he'd better first water the cow before he turned her out on the thatch so he took up a bucket to draw water out of the well but as he stooped down at the well's brick 
all the cream ran out of the churn over his shoulders and so down into the well now it was near dinner time and he hadn't even got the butter yet so he thought he'd best borrow the porridge and fill the pot with water and hung it over the fire when he had done that he thought the cow might perhaps fall off the thatch and break her legs or her neck so he got up on the house to tie her up one end of the rope he made fast to the cow's neck and the other he slipped down the chimney and tied round his own thigh and he had to make haste for the water now began to boil in the pot and he had still to grind the oatmeal so he began to grind away but while he was hard at it down fell the cow off the house top after all as she fell she dragged the man up the chimney by the rope there he stuck fast and as for the cow she hung half way down the wall swinging between heaven and earth for she could neither get down nor up and now the goody had waited seven lengths and seven dresses for her husband to come and call them home to dinner but never a call they had at last she thought she had waited long enough and went home but when she got there and saw the cow hanging in such an ugly place she ran up and cut the rope in two with her scythe but as she did this down came her husband out of the chimney and so when his old dame came inside the kitchen there she found him standing on his head in the pot rich pot End of section 5 East of the Sun and West of the Moon by Peter Christen and Spiansen and Young Engebretsen Mo Translated by George Webb Dunsant Section 6 of East of the Sun and West of the Moon This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Grace Petalino. East of the Sun and West of the Moon by Peter Christen Espiernsen and Jern Engebretsen Mo. Translated by George Webby Dacent. Section 6. The Lad Who Went to the North Wind. Once on a time, there was an old widow who had one son, and as she was poorly and weak, her son had to go up into the safe to fetch meal for cooking. But when he got outside the safe and was just going down the steps, there came the north wind, puffing and blowing, caught up the meal, and so away with it through the air. Then the lad went back into the safe for more. But when he came out again on the steps, if the north wind didn't come again and carry off the meal with a puff. And, more than that, he did so the third time. At this the lad got very angry, and as he thought it hard that the north wind should behave so, he thought he'd just look him up and ask him to give up his meal. So off he went, but the way was long, and he walked and walked, but at last he came to the north wind's house. Good day, said the lad, and thank you for coming to see us yesterday. Good day, answered the north wind, for his voice was loud and gruff, and thanks for coming to see me what do you want oh answered the lad i only wish to ask you to be so good as to let me have back that meal you took from me on the safe steps for we haven't much to live on and if you're to go on snapping up the morsel we have there'll be nothing for it but to starve i haven't got your meal said the north wind but if you are in such need i'll give you a cloth which will get you everything you want if you only say cloth spread yourself and serve up all kinds of good dishes with this the lad was well content but as the way was so long he couldn't get home in one day so he turned into an inn on the way and when they were going to sit down to supper he laid the cloth on a table which stood in the corner and said cloth spread yourself and serve up all kinds of good dishes he had scarce said so before the cloth did as it was bid and all who stood by thought it a fine thing but most of all the landlady 
So when all were fast asleep at dead of night, she took the lad's cloth and put another in its stead, just like the one he had got from the north wind, but which couldn't so much as serve up a bit of dry bread. So when the lad woke, he took his cloth and went off with it, and that day he got home to his mother. Now, said he, I've been to the north wind's house, and a good fellow he is, for he gave me this cloth, and when I only say to it, Cloth, spread yourself, and serve up all kinds of good dishes, I get any sort of food I please. All very true, I dare say, said his mother, but seeing is believing, and I shan't believe it till I see it. So the lad made haste, drew out a table, laid the cloth on it, and said, Cloth, spread yourself, serve up all kinds of good dishes. But never a bit of dry bread did the cloth serve up. Well, said the lad, there is no help for it but to go to the north wind again, and away he went. So he came to where the north wind lived late in the afternoon. Good evening, said the lad. Good evening, said the north wind. I want my rights for that meal of ours which you took said the lad. For, as for that cloth I got, it isn't worth a penny. I've got no meal, said the north wind. But yonder you have a ram which coins nothing but gold ducats, as soon as you say, ram, ram, make money. So the lad thought this a fine thing. But as it was too far to get home that day, he turned in for the night to the same inn where he had slept before. Before he called for anything, he tried the truth of what the north wind had said of the ram, and found it all right. But when the landlord saw that, he thought it was a famous ram. And when the lad had fallen asleep, he took another, which couldn't coin gold ducats, and changed the two. Next morning, off went the lad, and when he got home to his mother, he said, After all, the north wind is a jolly fellow, for now he has given me a ram, which can coin golden ducats if only I say, Ram, ram, make money. All very true, I dare say, said his mother, but I shan't believe any such stuff until I see the ducats made. Ram, ram, make money, said the lad, but if the ram made anything, it wasn't money. So the lad went back again to the north wind, and blew him up, and said the ram was worth nothing, and he must have his rights for the meal. Well, said the north wind, I've nothing else to give you but that old stick in the corner yonder. But it's a stick of that kind that if you say, stick, stick, lay on, it lays on till you say, stick, stick, now stop. So, as the way was long, the lad turned in this night, too, to the landlord. But as he could pretty well guess how things stood as to the cloth and the ram, he lay down at once on the bench and began to snore, as if he were asleep. Now the landlord, who easily saw that the stick must be worth something, hunted up one which was like it, and when he heard the lad snore, was going to change the two. But just as the landlord was about to take it, the lad bawled out, Stick! Stick! Lay on! So the stick began to beat the landlord till he jumped over chairs and tables and benches and yelled and roared, Oh my! Oh my! Bid the stick be still! Else it will beat me to death, and you shall have back both your cloth and your ram. When the lad thought the landlord had got enough, he said, Stick, stick, now stop. Then he took the cloth and put it into his pocket, and went home with his stick in his hand, leading the ram by a cord round its horns, and so he got his rights for the meal he had lost. End of section 6. Recorded by Grace Petalino. There we go. Ha ha. So, um, 
yeah. I got um I got some stuff figured out. So yay. Um I figured out what was taking so long, I believe. It was the the one shader. So this thing here. This thing here. This big whole huge thing right here. And it made everything um, slow down because I was using so many of them. It's good if you want to be able to adjust things. So I'll have to have to um, remember to do that because it's so um, because of its being so like um, because it's being so you know um, bleh, spit it out Nadine uh, intensive there we go that's that's the word um, it's resource intensive and I figured it out yay okay anyway I'll let you guys go have a wonderful day thanks for visiting and talk to you in a few minutes honey Love you guys. Like, subscribe, all that fun stuff. Bye.